past, past nine. So I will, you know, start to introduce Tian. Uh, Tian is a good friend and a good colleague uh, of me, of mine, uh, at the Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, he's a assistant professor in Harvard Medical School and, uh, you know, trained as a uh, mathematician. He's contributed to many uh, you know, domains in science, including the neural genetics, uh, neural imaging, uh, statistical genetic methods, and uh, the genetics of bio banks. So for today, uh, I'm very excited to have him talking about a uh, PRS, a new PRS method that is able to jointly uh, model GWAS's uh, summary statistics of multiple ancestries to improve the prediction accuracy. So without further ado, uh, Tian, let's get started. Okay. Um, thanks, Harim, for the very generous introduction and for having me today. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, our recent work that extends our Bayesian polygenic prediction framework, uh, which is known as PRCS, um, to PRCSX, which can now um, integrate GWAS summary stats from multiple populations in order to improve cross-population polygenic prediction. Um, so to start, I just like to um, briefly recap the idea of polygenic prediction and then talk about the motivation and intuition behind the PRSCS work, which might be useful to see how PRSCSX works. So as many of you already know, um, polygenic prediction summarizes the effects of genome-wide genetic markers to measure the genetic liability to a complex trait or disorder. So a conventional um, method to compute uh, such a polygenic risk score is pruning and thresholding, which is also known as the clumping and thresholding. So basically to apply this method, usually we set up a p-value threshold or, or screen a range of p-value thresholds. And for each of these p-value thresholds, we only consider SNPs reaching that significance level. level. Um, we then perform a procedure called LD clumping which basically retains the most significant SNP in each genomic region and discards all the SNPs that are in LD with the least SNP. So for example, in this figure, we will just keep the top SNP in purple um, and then remove all the SNPs that are in red, orange, green, light blue because they are in LD with the least SNP. Um, and then finally, we sum up the genotypes of the remaining SNPs weighted by the uh, effect size estimates from external GWAS. Um, so this pruning and thresholding method is very widely used because it's conceptually in intuitive um, and also computationally very efficient, but it has several limitations. So for example, uh, it relies on marginal GWAS association statistics. Um, and we know that most associated SNP in each region may not be causal. So a lot of times we might be using the suboptimal um, tagging SNP to build PRS. Um, and because, because of the LD clumping procedure we use, uh, the method also ignores uh, many of the secondary and tertiary signals in each genomic region. Um, and finally, when we sum up the SNPs, we use the effect size estimates directly from external GWAS without any um, adjustment or shrinkage but large effect size estimates in GWAS may suffer from this weakness curse. And, and most non-causal variants will have noisy non-zero effect size estimates. So by including these SNPs and using these GWAS effect size estimates directly without any adjustment, we are adding a lot of noise to our PRS. And, and all these um, limitations will limit the predictive, of, uh, predictive performance of PRS. Um, so to address these limitations and um, improve the conventional pruning and thresholding method, uh, a more principled framework is to calculate the polygenic risk score um, by jointly modeling the genetic markers across the genome without any arbitrary pruning and thresholding. Um, and to do this, we are basically um, fitting this linear regression problem where uh, the phenotype vector is regressed onto this genotype matrix X, and beta here is a vector of um, SNP effect size, um, and epsilon is um, a vector that captures non-genetic effects. So if we, if we can jointly fit this regression model and get the effect size estimates, which is denoted as beta hat here, we can take the estimate to um, to the target data set and weight the genotypes there 
and compute a polygenic risk score. Um, so the methodological challenge here is that in genomic prediction, we often have many more SNPs than uh, the number of samples we have. So this is a, a ultra high dimensional regression problem. Um, and we, uh, we need to regularize the effect size estimates to avoid overfitting. Um, and so we know that this pruning and thresholding method can actually be considered as a specific way of regularizing and shrinking the SNP effect size, because um, it in essence shrinks the effect size of discarded SNP to zero and performs no shrinkage on the effect size estimates of selected SNPs. But we have discussed that this, this shrinkage scheme, scheme uh, may be arbitrary and suboptimal. So there are many um, more principled statistical methods that can impose this shrinkage. Um, so for example, uh, the frequentist approach is to fit a regularized regression using methods like lasso or ridge regression or elastic net, which often encourage um, sparse effect size estimates and penalize large effects. Um, so if you have, um, so if you have heard of this method called lasso sum, so that's one of the polygenic prediction methods that applies lasso to build PRS. Um, so in the past few years, we also see many um, Bayesian polygenic prediction methods that have been developed. Um, and the Bayesian approach to tackle this high dimensional regression problem is to assign a prior on uh, SNP effect sizes to impose shrinkage. So all the models basically fit the same regression and the difference is what prior distribution to use. So the question here is, um, you know, how do we design a prior or, or which prior is optimal for this type of genomic prediction problem? Um, so the most widely used prior is um, what we call the infinitesimal normal prior, which is also known as the Bayesian ridge regression. So where um, the effect size of each SNP follows um, a normal distribution. So this model is very widely used in many classical statistical genetics methods, including like GCTA and LD score regression. Um, so all these methods assume this underlying infinitesimal normal um, genetic architecture. Um, and one major advantage of this prior, and also that's why this prior is so popular, is that it's mathematically tractable. Um, and there's a closed form expression for the posterior. Um, so here, um, lambda is a, a penalty parameter or, or shrinkage parameter, which depends on these two variants. One is the per SNP um, variance of the SNP effects. And the other one is, uh, is the residual variance here. So you can see that if the noise, the residual variance is large relative to the genetic signal, and then we impose a strong shrinkage on the effect size and beta is shrunk towards zero. So in the extreme case, if you have um, no genetic signal and then uh, the beta will be shrink uh, to zero. Um, on the other hand, if the genetic signal is relatively large to the noise and then the estimator will be closer to the least square estimator. And with this penalty parameter, uh, the matrix is always invertible. So this is a well-defined estimator. Um, so we also noticed that this is a multivariate estimate of SNP effect sizes. Um, and X transpose times X here is proportional to the LD matrix. So it's easy to incorporate LD information uh, in this estimator. And, and in practice, you can always divide the genome into independent LD blocks um, and then within each block, you can do this joint estimate of SNP effects. Um, so with this being said, um, there are also limitations of this prior. So as you can see here, the shrinkage parameter is a constant, uh, meining that under this infinitesimal normal prior, um, all the SNPs are treated equal and they are shrunk towards zero at the same constant rate. So this is suboptimal because um, Ideally, we want to impose very strong shrinkage on small and noisy non causal signals, but at the same time, we don't want to over shrink large and real signals. So what we really want is a shrinkage scheme that is adaptive to uh, different SNPs and different GWAS signals. But this cannot be achieved by this infinitesimal normal prior uh, because the 
penalty parameter here is a constant, which is not SNP specific. Um, so in, an alternative way to look at this problem is to take a look at the shape of the prior distribution, which is normal. Um, and this non-adaptive non nature of the prior is equivalent to say that, you know, for the normal distribution, um, when used as a prior, there isn't enough mass around zero to impose strong enough shrinkage on noisy signals. And, and because of this normal distribution has exponentially decayed tails. So these tails are too thin, meaning that a priori, we believe there's very low probability um, of large effect sizes. So we don't have a prior that can accommodate those large effect size, which often leads to overshrink of real signals. Um, so that's why the Bayesian ridge regression or in this infinitesimal normal prior is not very adaptive to different genetic architectures and usually only works well for highly polygenic traits. Um, so there are many work um, trying to design a more flexible prior so that the polygenic model is more adaptive to varying genetic architectures. And one idea is that um, in contrast to use a single normal distribution as the prior, we can use a mixture of two or more distributions. Um, so for example, one pioneering approach in this field, um, LD Pratt, uh, uses this spike and slab prior, which assumes that uh, a fraction of the SNPs are null, so they have no effect on the phenotype. Uh, while the rest of the SNPs are causal SNPs and, and their effect sizes follow a normal distribution. Um, so if we take a look at a density prior, uh, so this prior has two component. Um, so there's a spike component or which is a very narrow distribution centered at zero, um, which is often used to model small signals. Um, and there's a slab component, which is much wider and can be used to model large signals. And then by varying this proportion of um, the causal variance, uh, which is uh, coded in pi here. Uh, so this model can cover a wide range of genetic architectures. Um, so although this prior is much more flexible than the infinitesimal normal prior, uh, it also has two limitations. So number one, so this is a discrete mixture of two components. Uh, so we call this type of prior discrete mixture prior. So in posterior inference, uh, you can see that each SNP can either belongs to this null component or this normal component. Normal component. So you can imagine that if there are a million SNPs, then we have a discrete model space of um, two to the power of million possibilities, which is you know, almost unlikely to fully explore. Um, and number two, so unlike the infinitesimal normal prior, which has a closed form multivariate update of the SNP effects. So the spike and slab prior does not allow for a multivariate effect estimate. Um, so in posterior inference, one has to update effects as SNP by SNP, which makes it very difficult to incorporate LD information in this uh, model estimation procedure. Um, so there are many other Bayesian polygenic prediction methods that have been developed and, and use different priors, but the majority of them are discrete mixture priors. So for example, you can parameterize um, these two normal mixture differently using an additive version or a multiplicative version. Um, so you can also do a null component plus a T distribution, which gives you a heavier tail to model uh, larger signals. Um, so S space in R, which is another method that receives a lot of attention recently, uh, uses a mixture of four normals. And, and each of these normals um, captures the effect size distribution, distribu distribution on a different scale, uh, which, which makes the model even more flexible. Um, and then finally, there are non-parametric models where the effect size distribution is assumed to be a mixture of an infinite number of normals. And in posterior inference, the data will determine the optimal number of mixtures. Um, so these are different variations of this discrete mixture normals. So they are all discrete mixtures of 
two or more distributions. So they largely share um, the same advantages and limitations of LDPRED. Um, so just to quickly summarize, um, so we have um, discussed that, um, so the infinitesimal normal prior is computationally efficient and allows for multivariate modeling of L dependence, but it's not robust to varying genetic architectures. While um, discrete mixture priors, on the other hand, can um, create much more flexible models for the genetic architecture, but they are computationally challenging and it's um, often difficult to incorporate LD information. So our motivation was to design a prior that can combine the advantages of these two types of priors. Um, so um, in our um, PRCS work, we introduced this um, conceptually different class of priors, which is called continuous shrinkage priors. Um, and in contrast to this horizontal discrete mixture of normals, uh, we use the hierarchical scale mixture of normals. Um, and here, um, phi is a global shrinkage parameter, which is similar to the penalty parameter in ridge regression. And it is shared across all the SNPs um, and models the overall sparseness of the genetic architecture. And, and different from this infinitesimal normal prior, we added this local shrinkage parameter. Um, so here, J is the index of SNPs. So this local shrinkage parameter is SNP specific and can adapt to different genetic signals. And you can see that if we integrate out these hyperparameters, uh, the density function of this prior is continuous, which uh, can also be seen in this density plot on the right. So here, the dashed black line is the normal prior for reference. Um, and then the red and blue lines are the two components of the spike and slab prior. And the yellow line is the continuous shrinkage prior. So you can see that unlike this two component spike and slab prior, the prior we used is one continuous density function, but it can approximate the shape produced by these discrete mixture priors. And compared to the normal distribution, um, so you can see we put substantial um, mass near zero, which can impose strong shrinkage on small and noisy signals. And in the meantime, this, 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 this distribution has um, heavy polynomial tails, which can retain large and real signals. So the continuous shrinkage prior is almost um, as flexible as the discrete mixture prior, but because of its continuous nature, it also shares some advantages of the infinitesimal normal prior. Um, that is, it allows for the multivariate modeling of LD patterns, and it's also computationally efficient. Um, so these are the motivation and some intuitions behind PRCS. So I'm not going to talk about other features of features of the method, but the software is available on GitHub, which you can download and test. Uh, so we have we have released both pre-computed thousand genomes and UK Biobank reference panels for major populations, which hopefully has made the application um, easier. Um, and in the initial application of the PRCS method, so we applied it to some existing GWAS of six um, common complex diseases and six quantitative traits, and then predicting to uh, the Mass General um, Bergen Biobank. Um, and you can see that you know, PRCS substantially improved the prediction over this conventional pruning and thresholding method and often outperformed LDPRED. Um, and a second application that might be relevant to this group is uh, the polygenic prediction of schizophrenia. Um, and in this study led by Amanda, so we aggregated the schizophrenia cases and controls across four healthcare systems. So Geisinger, Mount Sinai, Mass General Bergen, and Vanderbilt. So as part of the PsychEmerge consortium. Um, and you can see this polygenic risk score calculated by PRSCS correlates with uh, the case prevalence and schizophrenia diagnosis um, and can be used to identify diseases that are genetically correlated with schizophrenia using a FIWAS design. So that's a um, review of the ideas behind um, 
PRCS and some of its applications. But one limitation of PRCS is that it was designed and tested in homogeneous populations. But now it is well, well recognized that um, cross-population predictive performance of polygenic risk scores decreases um, dramatically, especially when the target sample is genetically distant from the training sample uh, due to the predominant European samples in the current GWAS studies. So there are um, many factors that can limit the transferability of PRS learned transferability of PRS learned from European GWAS. Um, so for example, there may be population specific variants or, or variation in the SNP effect size estimates um, across populations. Um, the allele frequencies and LD patterns are different across populations. Um, and also the differences in the phenotyping or, or environmental factors can all affect the prediction accuracy. Um, so in the past few years, there have been um, many efforts to expand the scale of non-European GWAS and to diversify the samples in genomic research in general. Um, although the sample size of most non-European GWAS remain considerably smaller than European studies. Um, so they cannot, right now they cannot be used to fully characterize the genetic architecture in non-European populations and dissect the relative contributions of these factors to PRS predictive performance. But one question we can ask is, um, can we leverage these existing non-European GWAS to improve uh, trans-ethnic prediction of PRS, even if they are smaller than European GWAS? Mm, so we have been working on this um, method called um, PRSCSX, which is a very simple extension of the PRSCS framework. Um, so here to model um, existing non-European GWAS, we assume that we have data from K different populations. Um, and then we still use this continuous shrinkage prior to model SNP effects. But this time this prior is shared across populations. So we can see that uh, these shrinkage parameters do not depend on K, which is the index of population. So they are shared across populations. Um, and to use this coupled prior, we have implicitly made an assumption that causal variants are largely shared across populations. So we think this is a reasonable assumption given that many recent studies have estimated the trans-ethnic genetic correlations for many complex traits and diseases to be moderate to high. Um, and with this coupled prior, so we can borrow information across summary statistics um, and increased accuracy of effect size estimation, particularly for non-European populations whose GWAS sample size are relatively small. Um, and the other advantage of this coupled prior is that we can leverage the LD diversity across populations to better localize the GWAS signal. So this is very similar to the idea of um, trans-ethnic fine mapping um, so although we are not doing any formal fine mapping analysis here, we, we are actually using this idea. Um, so although we use this shared prior across populations, um, the effect size for a SNP are still allowed to vary across populations. And so we believe this gives um, the model more flexibility. So we don't constrain the effect size to be the same across populations. And we also allow for population-specific variants, meaning that so if a SNP is available in one population but absent in other populations due to, for example, the low frequency in other populations, we still include the SNP in the model. Although in this case, there's no effects to couple, but we still include the SNPs in the modeling. Um, so finally, um, PRSCSX inherits many features from PRSCS. So it allows for this multivariate modeling of LD patterns using uh, population specific reference panels and also um, computationally efficient. Um, so in practice, uh, PRSCSX takes the GWAS summary stats um, and the ancestry matched LD reference panels from multiple populations. Um, it then jointly um, 
models or this data fits the model, and then output one set of the SNP posterior effect size for each discovery population. And then these SNP effect size estimates can then be taken to a validation data set and calculate one PRS for each population. And we then learn an optimal linear combination of these PRS in, a, in the validation data set um, and evaluate the predictive performance of the final PRS in an in in independent testing data. Um, so as a comparison and um, also in the results I'm going to show, uh, so we examine two alternative methods that can combine GWAS summary stats from multiple populations. Uh, one method which we call um, PT meta here, um, it performs a fixed effect meta-analysis of the GWAS and then applies the um, pruning and thresholding method to the meta GWAS. Um, and since the LD pattern is mixed after this meta-analysis, so we test different LD reference panels in this case, and then select the one with the best predictive performance to evaluate um, in the testing data set. Um, so the other method which we call um, PT multi, um, uh, this method was developed by Alcus Price group a few years back. Um, so they applied pruning and thresholding separately to each G1 summary statistics and then the resulting PRS are linearly combined in the validation data set um, and then taken uh, to, the, to the final PRS for, for evaluation. Okay. Um, so here are some um, results. So we selected um, 17 quantitative traits that are shared between the UK Biobank and Biobank Japan. And in this analysis, UK Biobank GWAS sample size is typically um, three to six times larger than the BBJ Biobank Japan GWAS. Um, so we then train uh, different PRS using um, BBJ GWAS only. So these are the PRS methods that apply to the Biobank Japan GWAS only. And then uh, these are um, the PRS that was trained on UK Biobank data only. And then the last three methods are um, those PRS that combine the GWAS summary stats from the UK Biobank and Biobank Japan. And then we train these different PRS and then predict into um, different populations in the UK Biobank that are independent of the UK Biobank training GWAS. So you can see, so here in the first panel, when the target sample is the UK Biobank European population, um, and you can see that um, PRS trained with the ancestry match, the UK Biobank GWAS performs better than PRS trained with uh, the BBJ GWAS, which is expected. Um, and in this case, combining the UK Biobank and BBJ GWAS doesn't help too much. Um, so you can see there's a very uh, small, probably five, around 5% 5 of improvement in prediction accuracy when we combine UK Biobank and Biobank Japan GWAS. So that's likely because the UK Biobank GWAS was already um, quite powerful. So adding a smaller East Asian GWAS doesn't help too much in the prediction uh, in the prediction of European samples. Um, but when we predict into the UK Biobank East Asian samples, um, you can see um, PRCSX can increase the prediction accuracy. Um, here, the bar shows the median, var uh, median variance explained that was in increased by about 25% when, when comparing, uh, with, when comparing uh, PRCSX with these PRS trained on the European GWAS. And then if you compare with uh, this ancestry matched PRS trained in the Baobank Japan GWAS, the improvement was even larger, it's around 80%. So these results show that we can leverage this large scale European GWAS to improve the prediction in non-European populations. 
Um, and then when we predict into the UK Biobank African samples, um, the target population didn't match any of the discovery sample, the Biobank Japan sample or the UK Biobank sample. Um, and, and both the European and East Asian samples are genetically distant from the African samples. So uh, in this case, the improvement in predictions was again limited. Um, and the predictions in the African population remain quite low relative to the predictions in European and East Asian populations. Um, so we asked whether we can add some African samples to the discovery data set to improve the prediction in the African population. Um, and among the 17 traits we examine here, seven um, were also available in the PAGE study, which largely comprised of African-American and Hispanic Latino samples. Um, but you can see the sample size of the PAGE study um, was much smaller than the UK Biobank and Biobank Japan. So the question here is, uh, whether adding a small African GWAS to the discovery data set can improve prediction. Um, and you can see in the right panel of this figure, um, so when integrating uh, this UK Biobank, Biobank Japan, and page summary stats using um, PRCSX, the prediction in African sample uh, was um, quite dramatically improved and improvement in the median varying explain was about 70% when comparing with the PRCSX applied to uh, UK Biobank and Biobank Japan GWAS only. And the prediction was also much better than the PRS train on ancestry matched page study. So these results suggest that we can leverage samples that have uh, matched ancestry with the target population to improve prediction, even if the non-European training GWAS are considerably smaller than European studies. Um, so adding the page study as a discovery data set also improved the prediction in other target populations, although um, the improvement was um, uh, to a much less extent. Um, so in the last example, so we evaluated um, different PRS methods in the prediction of schizophrenia risk. Um, so in, in this analysis, we use the GWAS summary statistics derived from the PGC2 schizophrenia GWAS in the European samples, um, and also uh, the recent schizophrenia GWAS in the East Asian samples led by Max Lam, Chayan, and Hai Liang and colleagues. Um, so we have access to the individual level data of um, six East Asian cohorts. Um, and we left out one cohort as the validation data set. So this is the data set we use to learn hyperparameters or linear combinations of PRS. And then for the remaining six cohorts, we uh, apply the leave one out approach. So meaning that we in turn use one of the six cohorts as the testing data set, and then meta-analyze the remaining five cohorts with the other cohorts to generate the discovery GWAS for the East Asian population. Um, we then build, again, build different PRS using uh, the East Asian GWAS only, or using uh, the European GWAS only, or using methods that can combine these two GWAS. Um, and you can see that uh, the PRCSX can increase the prediction accuracy relative to uh, methods trained on a single GWAS. And then the um, median variance explained here had uh, approximately 50% increase relative to uh, GWAS using the ancestry matched East Asian GWAS. Um, and almost double the prediction accuracy here when the PRS was trained really using European GWAS. And on the right panel, um, you can see that at the tail of the PRS distribution, um, PRCSX can also better stratify patients at top and bottom um, PRS percentiles relative to other methods. Um, Okay, so I think I will um, stop here and thank all my collaborators. So in particular,
Uh, Yun Feng has led many of the real data analysis in this project, and Haliang has critical inputs in every aspect of the project. And he also led uh, the Stanley Center um, East Asian Initiative, which made the um, schizophrenia analysis in the East Asian cohorts possible. Um, and then our preprint is on um, Med Archive. And we, are, we have also released the software on GitHub. So any feedback or comments will be uh, much appreciated. So I will stop here and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks a lot, Tian. That's a great talk. So um, we have 20 minutes for questions. A terrific talk, Tiana. Really appreciate it. So um, I'll just start things off. I'm sure there's other questions, um, but I guess one question I have is: It seems like with these methods uh, beyond pruning and thresholding, one of the big barriers is that some of them are harder to implement than others. Um, pruning and thresholding is so easy, um, and so I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about um, how difficult it is to implement this approach and what. Um, what information people need to be able to um, use PRS um, CSX? Um, yeah, so um, I guess in many of the analysis, we still use pruning and thresholding as a baseline because it's computationally faster and also a robust approach. So you can use that as a comparison. Um, so in terms of those basic methods, um, depending on um, the different implementations and different methods will require um, different computational costs and usually it takes longer than pruning and thresholding. Um, but um, we have tried to, you know, hopefully make this um, software easy to use. So we have released these uh, reference panels. So users usually don't need to calculate their own reference panels. Um, and then we can parallel the computation across chromosomes. And then um, usually for the longest chromosome, it takes around an hour or one and a half hours to finish. So I think um, it's um, hopefully it doesn't add too much computational burden on the end user. That's really helpful. That's definitely useful. Right. And so people just need summary statistics from multiple populations, of course. Um, yeah. And then the other the other things are provided um, with your software. Yeah. Great. So on that topic, Tian, uh, could you perhaps discuss a little bit about the admixed population? Uh, you know, I think not every population has a released reference panel. So what are the considerations here, and uh, what are things you know these people can do if they want their you know uh, analysis? Being done. Right, this that's method. a great question. Um, there's, there are a lot of challenges in terms of how to handle um, amix populations because um, you know the LD patterns might depend on specific studies and, and the proportion of the samples in each study. So um, I don't think there's a universal reference panel that can be used for all the admix populations. Um, so right now, so for example, in this study, when we try to model the, the page GWAS summary stats, um, so it's sort of a mixture of African-American samples and also Latino um, Hispanic samples, so it's kind of an mixture. Um, so we try to use an um, African reference panel to approximate in this situation and turn out to work okay. But clearly, there are still a lot of work to do and think about how to better model the admix populations and how to build reference panels in this case. Hi, maybe I can ask a question. So um, certainly, um, deal with uh, summary statistic uh, is always simpler, um, but at the same time uh, more difficult, right? Because you lose uh, lots of uh, detailed information. 
so, but I'm curious if you have individual level genotype data, will you be able to do that better uh, for the missed population? Because you should be able to have a much higher individual level resolution in, in regarding the uh, population local structure, right? Um, right, so I think there are two aspects of this question. So number one is, you know, do we lose any information when we use summary stats relative to individual data, whether it's a homogeneous population or a mixed population? Right. Um, so the question that the answer to that question is, so if we only look at, um, only use the second order information, it's basically the LD information, um, and then you assume you have a LD reference panel that can accurately approximate the true LD patterns in your GWAS sample. And then there's actually no information loss when we use the reference, use the summary stats data relative to the individual level data. Um, so the question here is, can we um, find a GWAS, ref can we find a reference panel that can closely approximate LD patterns in your GWAS sample? Um, and so a lot of times, you know, when the GWAS sample, GWAS was conducted in a homogeneous population, we think, um, you know, the, the reference panel was accurate enough, but that also, you know, warrants, you know, if, if in the future, it's possible to release in-sample LD information with the GWAS summary stats. We can, of course, do better and get more accurate LD patterns. Um, so we will have less information loss or less um, reference sample mismatch um, in this case. Um, and then the second part of the question was, you know, if we have individual level data, can we do better to handle admixed populations. Um, and I think, sure, because with individual level data, you can go beyond LD. Um, you can look at local ancestry um, and do those decomposition and build um, PRS using those local ancestry information, uh, which can, of course, be much more accurate than uh, treating the whole genome in a homogeneous way. Um, so I think going forward, um, releasing LD information and local genetic information with the GWAS summary, summary stats might be the key to further improve polygenic prediction these FX populations. Just follow that. Um, so do, will you have an implementation uh, to uh, deal with individual level genotype data? Um, we don't actually, but but if you have individual level data, you can just compute the in-sample LD and then do a GWAS. So then apply the methods to the GWAS summary stats that should give you, um, you know, highly similar results to uh, a method using individual level information. Thank you. I think we had a question from Laura Sloopman. We did, but it was answered because I didn't, uh, I thought the, the answer was uh, truncated before uh, the individual level conversation. Uh, I was going to ask specifically about what you just clarified. Hi, Dr. Gur. This is Ya Wenzhen. Could I ask a practical question? Um, we usually transfer R ratio to log R ratio before calculating PIS based on LD pooling and p value threshold approach. So my question is, do we need also do the same process in PIS CS? 
uh, because we know that the posterior effect size in this approach is relatively small if we don't um, process the arch ratio to log arch ratio before calculated um, posterior effect size. Uh, right, so PRCS can take odds ratio, odds ratio estimates, but basically just take the odds ratio and take the log and convert it to standardized beta. So if you, you know, GWAS summary is that um, it is odds ratio, then it's fine and PRCS can take that. Thank you. I thought it was really encouraging to see how much better the prediction was with the page samples for the African ancestry individuals. Um, do you have any um, ideas about why that worked as well as it did? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think number one, so there are still uh, population specific variants and information that, that are containing the in the page study, GWAS summaries that that's not available in the GWAS of other populations. Um, the other possibility might be, you know, when you integrate these GWAS, um, so because the LD pattern, um, that the LD block is smaller in African samples, so we have a better um, localization of the GWAS signal, which also improved the prediction accuracy. But I, I think there's much work to do to dissect these contributions and see um, you know, whether we can improve on that. I think it's just, it's very encouraging because I think sometimes when you see samples for European ancestries that are, are over an order of magnitude or more larger than the other ancestries, you think, well, maybe it's not worth it, including these other ancestries, but it sounds like these data are suggesting that definitely you should. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have a question. Uh, I think someone said about the phenotype. I just wonder if do you think that, you know, for the Latin population, it's because, you know, I think the sample size is small. If, if you have a better phenotype, something like that, should you have more chance to, you know, to, I don't know, but to predict it in this meta-analysis or Phenotype is something, it's a variable that matter here or not, you know, it's just, I don't know, if you start a project in Latin American that is totally mixed and you don't know, and you have sample, the small sample size, do you think it's, you know, it's good to spend, uh, I don't know, money or time having a deep phenotype or this is, does not matter? Mm -hmm. So, so phenotype typing def definitely influences the prediction accuracy of um, PRS. And then, if you have very different phenotyping in, uh, say, your training and target populations, that might reduce the prediction accuracy. And in many of our work, um, so when we try different phenotyping methods, so for example, when we try to predict depression, and then there are different ways to phenotype like using ICD codes or um, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, using any rule-based or uh, algorithm-based definition of depression case and controls. And they do give us um, meaningfully different um, prediction accuracy. And a lot of times, um, you know, there's a balance here because if you use the simpler ICD-based methods, you get, you know, more cases and controls, but if you use the more stringent definition, you get higher specificity, but um, sometimes lower power because the case number is reduced. Um, so I think, again, there's a, a many factors that contribute here, you know, the sample size and how the phenotyping matches between the discovery and target data set and how specificity, specific the phenotyping algorithm is. Um, a lot of times, you know, when you conduct the PRS analysis, these phenotyping um, issues beyond our control because we only use GWAS summary stats or, or test the PRS in existing cohorts. But if you have control over these phenotyping algorithms, 
um, I think some careful ways of um, phenotyping can sometimes boost the prediction of PRS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So other question is just today I saw, you know, a talk in a conference that they use uh, family uh, polygen trios or families to predict this polygenic risk score. And then, you know, they have this analysis using trios. What do you think about that? It's a good strategy or? Um, right. I think trio or family studies provide um, additional um, opportunities that can't be done by uh, PRS of um, unrelated individuals. For example, you can better control environmental factors and sometimes you can even decompo uh, decompose um, and dissect the PRS of transmitted and non-transmitted alleles. Uh, yeah. So these are interesting questions that you can only do in family or trio studies. So uh, I think both methods are, so, so it, so a lot of what we do is to do this PRS analysis in population-based cohort and trying to stratify patients, for example. But um, in terms of family study, they also give a different or unique aspect where you can look at the relative contribution of genetic environment. So I think both study designs are useful and can be used to answer different questions. But should the other method can be used in this approach? Um, that's a good question. So right now, probably not because when we build the model, we assume the GWAS summaries that's were uh, mm -hmm. calculated on um, a large and unrelated GWAS sample. Mm -hmm. um, so if we want to conduct any um, any PRS analysis that is specific to a family or trio design probably need to look into you know, more specific methods that can you know, better address the questions there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I actually have some trouble hearing the first part of the question. Oh, maybe I I, I speak it louder. Uh, is this better now? My voice. Hey, can you hear me? The voice quality is not great. Um, speaking up, it seems like helps a little, but it's still a little bit difficult to hear. Um, maybe uh, is it is it now better? Chat. Sorry. I think it's better sending the question in the chat because it's- Okay, sure. Yeah, it's I, I will type it then. I will type the question, sorry. I don't know, sorry. I don't know if you, uh, we have time, but- <laughs> uh, Yeah, no problem. If you have any questions, you can also you know, email me afterwards. The question was, how are the two matrices handled in your method, um, two different LD matrices? Um, right, so we use, so there are, you know, if you have GWAS summary stats from different populations, you'll have one LD, so population specific LD, the matching ancestry of the GWAS. And then when we do this effect size estimates, they are actually taken care of. And then, so different, um, 
effect size in different populations were modeled by the matching LD reference panels. And there's a follow-up question that how are the variants with different um, minor frequency being handled in two different matrices? Um, how minor little frequencies are handled. Um, so we don't, well, so I'm not sure how to answer this question. So how minor little frequencies are handled. So when you compute the LD matrix, um, you're just using the population specific reference panel to compute that LD matrix. And that gives you um, the matrix for each population. And then when we model the effect size and those effect size are, and, and the relationship between SNPs in each population uh, was mapped to the population specific LD reference panel. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. All right, so I think we're at the hour. Thanks, uh, Tian, for giving this great talk, and thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, for 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 this meeting. And I, we look uh, forward to seeing each other again in a month. Yes, Take I care, think the everyone. next the next meeting is May fifth. May fifth. May fifth, and I think believe we're back at the uh, one one o five p.m. Eastern. Great. Thanks so much, Tian, and great to see everyone. Great to see everyone. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.